Hey there, welcome back. So um, we are actually starting a new series of videos here um, at Gimbe Academy. And what we're gonna try to do is from time to time, we're gonna get authors who have written books related to continuous improvement, Lean Six Sigma, whatever it might be, and kind of have them give us a book review. I mean, I can do the book review, um, but I think it's even better to, uh, to have the actual author tell us about their book. And we're going to take some shots of the, of the books and just give you a really good feeling of whether or not you want to read it. <laughs> and, you know, it could be seen as we're trying to, you know, help them sell books and that's fine if you want to buy books. But really, we're trying to provide the value of letting you know what this books, these books are all about. And then if you want to buy it, great. Um, and if you don't, that's fine too. But to start, we're going to uh, meet with our friend Karen Martin. Thank you so, so much for having me here, Ron. Many of you have seen uh, Karen already. We've done some interviews in, uh, it was in Toronto at the yes. AME conference. Uh, but Karen is actually here in our studios here in, in Fort Worth. So uh, the, what we're going to start with is um, your latest book, Karen, Value Stream Mapping. Um, and uh, how to visualize work and align leadership for organizational transformation. And uh, um, Mike Osterling is your co-author. Co yes. Okay. So what I want to start with, though, is, you know, Gemba Academy obviously has a value stream mapping course. And many of the folks here um, watching this video are probably familiar with Learning to See, which is, uh, I guess, the original Bible of yes. value stream mapping written by uh, John Shook and um, uh, Mike Rother, Mike Rother mm -hmm. um, from the Lean Enterprise Institute. Great book. Um, what I wanted to start with is the first um, kind of, um, I don't know, what do you call these? Uh, the blurbs. Blurbs on the back of the book <laughs> here from John Shook, who is the chairman and CEO of the Lean Enterprise Institute and author of Learning to See. Yes. Okay. It says, value stream mapping has evolved from its roots as a tool used by geeks <laughs> to reimagine and reconfigure manufacturing operations to a process to enable deep organizational intervention and transformation. With value stream mapping, Karen Martin and Mike Osterling provide an outstanding guide for practitioners engaged in the challenging work of improving the horizontal flow of value across organizations. So it's pretty incredible that the guy who wrote the original Bible yes. on value stream mapping uh, wrote such nice things. So yes. first question before we get into the details of the book, Karen, why did you write this book and w w why should anyone read it if they've read Learning to See? Yeah, good question. So we love Learning to See. We both learned from Learning to See. That's yep. how we learned to map. Uh, one thing that we've noticed since Learning to See was released is that the office service and knowledge work world didn't seem to connect with it quite as much as manufacturing did. Yeah. And there are, in fact, some nuances. I mean, it's, it's mainly the same way you go about mapping a value stream, but there are some nuances that are critical. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason. The other thing is that we see a lot of value stream maps, so-called value stream maps, that aren't really value stream maps. And so we felt it was time to kind of rethink mm -hmm. and, and remind people that maybe newer to Lean and maybe didn't even read Learning to See because it was 1999 when that came out. Gosh, what not a, long ago, huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> long time. <laughs> yeah. So what a value stream map really is and, and you know, how to, I, I liken it to a Ferrari. You know, if you keep the Ferrari in the garage, then it's not going to be very happy. And if you take it out on 35 mile an hour roads, you'll get some benefit. Yeah. But if you let that thing roll, you know, on an open highway, then that's where the Ferrari shines. Yeah. And value stream mapping can be that same thing. Yeah. Yeah. for organizations. Nice, nice. So let's just kind of walk through the book. These are these videos are going to be kind of short. Um, who, who, who wrote the uh, the uh, introduction? And did you guys write that yourselves? Yeah, we wrote okay. it ourselves. Uh -huh. the, the book, we didn't have a preface or a, a prologue, sometimes people call it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we wrote it all. Well, let's, I think what might be helpful is just kind of kind of go through each chapter. So there's six okay. chapters and we're going to get some shots of the book here that we'll We'll cut in here. So value stream management is chapter one, and it's uh, 26 pages. So what's going on, and, and what's the high-level uh, elevator speech for, for chapter one? Yeah, so chapter one is all about what a value stream really is and what it is not. And so a lot of people get confused between process-level mapping and value stream mapping. So that is you know, getting people very clear on how big we're talking about across an organization and why to map. So it's a little bit about the why yeah. and the what is it. And then the how comes after that. Okay. All right. S chapter two, setting the stage and enabling success. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so most organizations die fine don't do proper planning for value stream mapping. Yep. And uh, we very much believe in the use of a very formal charter. Yep. And the charter is used to scope it, 
It's used for team formation, and you don't form the team, by the way, until it's properly scoped. Um, it's used as a communication tool, a consensus building tool. That's another, th the power of charters that are properly socialized is that you get everyone understanding before you even begin why you're even doing this. Yeah. What problems are we trying to solve? Mm. Um, so that, that chapter really centers on the development of the charter and socializing the charter. Now, it's been a while since I've, I, I, I have read the book, um, and there was, some, there was a section in here, I, I can't remember where, exactly where it was, where it talked about the team, and there was one thing that was kind of an aha moment for me, um, and uh, I wanted to explore it. You, you wrote about the fact that, that team member selection for the value stream map um, helped me out. It shouldn't necessarily be the frontline workers. Right. right. Yeah, Talk a, lot, a little bit about that. Yeah, thank I think you. that was thank in this you chapter. For, yes, wasn't yes, that? it is. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. It's vital. So, a lot of value stream maps are being done by operators and team leads and things like that. And while there's some benefit in that because they're more knowledgeable about the current state, the problem is they don't have the authority to yeah. authorize the kinds of future state improvements that are big. Right. And so, we've played around with team formation for, you know, since 1999. Yeah. And we believe that you do better by by biasing the team toward leadership, so heavily leadership oriented, and I mean as high as you can. So one thing we say in the book is, uh, go as high as you can, except as low as you need to. So most of my teams have vice presidents on them and sometimes C-level. Mm -hmm. um, and because, again, the future state is something where if you're just a manager or a frontline person, you may not be able to say, hey, yeah, let's cut this functional area out of the value stream altogether. Let's cross-train these two functional areas to do this work instead of having a handoff with a delay. Let's you know, rethink how we even uh, launch this product. You know, that's big things. What are your thoughts though on having some also having some frontline folks in there? Do you do you do that as well? Um um, we we do uh, if they have the right composition. So so one thing to think about is in the future state, you're usually talking about some pretty big organizational changes if you're using it as the Ferrari. Yeah. Um, and so if they, you have frontline people in the team, they have to be pretty mature and able to handle paradigms, you know, big sure. organizational paradigms being yeah. challenged. Some of the future state discussions and current state discussions can get um, you know a little tricky where you're talking about. Uh, maybe some customer problems and things like that. So if you have lower level people on the team, they have to be able to sure. handle those kinds of conversations. Yeah, and or my job might change. Right, right, right. right. Who moved my cheese, right? Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see the new book that's out? It's, I moved your cheese. Oh, really? Yeah, no, I have not seen that. I moved your cheese. Oh, very cool. <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out. I have not seen that. Okay. Yes. All right. Good All point. right. So chapter three is understanding the current state. And that looks like it's a pretty meaty chapter. Yeah. So, uh, Close yeah. to 50 pages. Yeah, that's when we get into the mechanics of mapping, the actual how to, you know, on a on a wall with 36 inch wide paper and post-its and markers at yeah. hand, what do you do? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where we talk about the frontline engagement and how walking the value stream or going to the Gemba uh, is the proper way to get that cur that frontline involvement. So now what's different about your approach there to learning to see? Because obviously learning to see is very right. prescriptive as well. Uh, nothing. It's very much the same okay. as far as going to the Gemba at this stage. Yeah. The office and service world just aren't used to doing that. Yeah. And so we're trying to push that message that even if it's a value stream that crosses a you know several buildings and seas and seas of cubicles, yeah. you know, it still is valuable to go out and walk the value yeah. stream because you get insights you'll never get sitting yeah. in a conference room. Yeah. And asking the front lines for the questions and asking them for some of the metrics that we right. use, they're the experts, yeah. right? So, and that, that going to the Gamba is such a bonding experience between the front lines and leadership. And leaders almost always are like, oh my gosh, we had no idea. Yeah. We, the ahas are just enormous. Yeah. So, it, and you, know, you don't just and go out. And hopefully it sets a good stage for, hey, Mr. C-level guy, get out of your office once in a while. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. almost like you're training them how to be better leaders. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You and know. the understanding that both levels get is, is one of the side benefits. You know, there's a lot of kind of longer term organizational and psychological benefits and behavioral benefits that come from value stream yeah. mapping than just the results. Exactly. All right. Uh, chapter four, developing the f or designing the future state. Yeah, so this was tricky. We didn't know how far to go with this because obviously there are books and books written on every different 
countermeasure or solution yeah. um, that you could use. And so what we did with this is we just gave people a framework for how to think about the future state, yeah. but we don't go into detail, for example, of you know how to balance with tech time and yeah. you know how do you decide exactly how to error proof. You know, at this point you're just discovering that you have errors yeah. and you need to error proof. Yeah. Um, so it was uh, it's a book that gives three different categories of questions and we do more than just the eight questions or seven questions that's in learning to see. Uh, we have, I, I forget how many questions, but it's in the 20s. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are lots of questions and the more complex the environment, the more you have to consider more questions. Right, right, okay. And uh, chapter five, um, which I think is possibly my biased opinion, the most important, <laughs> developing the transformation plan. Right. So, value stream maps are only a means to an end, and the end is results. And so if you have beautifully done value stream maps all over walls and nothing is happening to transform the work, then what's the point, right? Yeah. Wallpaper. So the transformation plan, the way we do it, is it's a, a you know Excel tool that has line items for every Kaizen burst on the future state. And every line item has an owner, and we have a Gantt-ish chart that we use. Mm -hmm. And you know, they don't have to use ours; they can do their own yeah. plans. But um, on ours, it's you know a beginning, uh, beginning date and end date, and then it has a little status column that auto-populates color codes how far along you are. So that plan becomes the PDCA, PDSA, Plan Do Study Adjust cycle of okay, these are all experiments, right? Yeah. And so you're doing many experiments within the plan. And as you're going through and getting results, then you, you know, update the plan, and that becomes the uh, the discussion point of do we do we go ahead and go ahead and implement what we thought we needed to based on the future state map, given that now conditions may have changed. Mm. So it's not a plan sent in cement. Yeah, it's a plan that you're constantly looking Dynamic. at and yeah and yeah. reevaluating, and it's you know helping the organization actually yeah. make that transformation. Got it. Got it. All right. Chapter six, achieving transformation. That's about how to how to get stickiness, you know, how to mm. get it to to stick and not slip back. And one of the things we suggest there is that without a single owner over an entire value stream, it's very difficult to get the value stream um, being viewed and managed and monitored and measured consistently in a way that doesn't allow it to start slipping back or start deviating from whatever the target condition was. So we suggest a value stream manager, and it's, um, it's a pretty um, tough thing for the average, very functionally siloed organization with a you know, uh, org chart that's set in stone to, to even consider having this one person that crosses over those functions that is the leader uh, and the one that doesn't you know, dictate anything, but they're the ones that are responsible for how work is flowing across a large swath of the enterprise, and so that value stream manager role is critical. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now, there's several um, different appendix um, sections here in the book, uh, value stream icons, um, outpatient imaging, what's going on with these? Uh, uh, yeah, so we had a, a very difficult decision deciding whether throughout the book to show different kinds of maps for different industries, different types of work and all of that, or whether to have a kind of industry neutral or industry agnostic map that shows how to construct it when you're doing the mechanics part of it. We opted finally for the this anonymous, like a anonymous kind of map, an agnostic map that is for any value stream. I mean, stream. not Acme stamping? No, <laughs> no. Isn't that what it's, it's called? Yeah, Acme stamping. Making mirrors, exactly. wasn't it? Or exactly. Something like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you have someone in healthcare be like, I don't relate to Acme stamping. I don't stamping. make mirrors. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, you know, that's, that's, there's a lot you can learn from other, other industries' maps, but we wanted to get rid of that kind of resistance up front. So what we did in the appendices is we put samples of very many you know, different maps yeah. so that people can see something a little closer to their industry yeah. and say, oh, okay, there's a healthcare one, there's a yeah. manufacturing one, there's a software development yeah. one, you yeah. know, that type of thing. That's great. So mm -hmm. hopefully we pulled it off. Okay, so Karen, what would you do differently? If you had to write this book again, what would you do differently? Yeah, that's a good question. So every author, I think, if they're honest, will tell you that the minute the book goes to press, you have these head-slapping moments where you're like, ah, oh, I wish I would have included this. And then when readers start sending in comments and questions and things, you start realizing that, you know, if only you had another two months, you could, you know, perhaps finish the book. And um, yeah, one of my 
editors always said, you know, you never finish a book, you just turn it in. So one of the things that I, we realize now from some questions we're getting that would have been nice to have at least a footnote on is, for example, lead time treatment in manufacturing versus the office and service world. There's a little different way that you handle lead time and WIP, work in process on the map, something technical, but, um, but, it, but it's important because people who learn from learning to see are now seeing us suggesting a different way for lead time in the information yeah. environments that are making them go like, whoa, 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 what? Um, so I blogged about it last week in order to get that clarification out there, and I'll continue blogging as people ask these great questions. So we'll link to your blog article too. Okay, on, great. On this video, so great. Yeah, so that. that's one example of something. And then the one thing that I, I think, you know, you never know how to start a book, but I just had a client go through value stream mapping, mm -hmm. and this was probably one of the most successful value stream mapping activities I've ever facilitated, in large part because of the team they put together, very high level. They were. This is all projected, but I think they have a very good shot of this. They're projecting that they're going to shorten their lead time from 17 months to seven and a half months mm -hmm. from PO to delivery. Nice. They're going to free up the equivalent of 23 FTEs mm -hmm. in the amount of process time they're reducing, getting waste and annoying rework out of the process, the value stream. And they're going to, uh, what was the third thing? It was lead time, process time. Oh, they're freeing up $25 million in working capital per year wow. because of being able to bill more quickly. Sure. Huge results. And I don't think that the average value stream yields those kinds of results, but I don't think we were as clear in the beginning that, again, this is not process mapping. This is big right. organizational Material transformation. And information. Yeah. Right. yeah, and it's, it's organization-wide transformation so that you can get huge quantifiable results. I don't think we did quite as good a job as okay. I wish we would have done on that. All right. All so. Right. so so last question. Who who aside from everyone, who should buy this book? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a good and maybe question. Maybe who shouldn't buy this book? Is there anyone? Um, I guess a difficult someone who, question to ask an oh, author. Well, I think someone who's already highly proficient in value stream mapping, in real value stream mapping, yeah. wouldn't need to buy the book necessarily. Yeah. Unless they just, you know, sometimes once you're an expert in something or proficient in something, it's worth going back just to learn. You know, I mean, some I'd like nuances. to think I've done hundreds of value stream maps, and I'd like to think I'm pretty good at it. And I, I know there's definitely wis there's wisdom in here that I was like. Hmm. Yeah, there's always a different so. way to think about things. So we have two markets. One is the practitioner mm -hmm. that is leading, facilitating value stream mapping, and the other market are leaders. And we have an executive summary guide that's the pages that are critical for leaders to read because a lot of the people that come to us say, you know, we want to do this, but we can't get our vice presidents to even, you know, come to the table mm -hmm. and map with us. Right. And so we need to get the book in those hands of why they should be involved in and get them to understand this is strategic level improvement design. Yeah. This isn't tactical. This yeah. is strategic. And, yeah. and so that would be an audience that we would love to have. Read All right. So uh, I guess you can buy it everywhere books are sold. Everywhere. All right. And we're going to have a link to it here next to this video. So I uh, highly recommend it. Karen, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank All you right. very much. Take care.